Hello, and welcome to this Association of Corporate Treasures webinar, where today we'll be hearing from one of the big three rating agencies on its perspective on ratings during this pandemic. Many companies went into 2020 expecting some form of recession, but I don't think anything could have prepared us for the speed of transmission of the COVID-19 virus and the swiftness and depth of impact on the global economy. Governments around the world responded with a range of funding solutions with programs aimed at larger companies requiring some form of credit appraisal. In the UK, the Bank of England has launched the COVID corporate financing facility, and one of the requirements of participation was originally an investment grade credit rating. Now, although the conditions have been flexed, it's still important to be considered investment grade quality. Now, along with other members of the policy and technical team and our chief exec, I've been talking with a number of treasurers since the crisis started. And a large number of these are of investment grade quality, but have never had an external credit rating. And these companies want to understand more about the ratings and the rating process. For those that do have ratings, what's the outlook going to be for them? Well, to help us understand how ratings are being affected and also what a rating involves, I'm delighted to welcome the global group head of corporate ratings from Fitch, one of the big three rating agencies. Now, a bit of housekeeping. You'll see a button on your screen that allows you to submit questions. We'd like this session to be as interactive as possible, so please don't wait until the end, but submit questions as we go through, and we'll endeavor to cover off as many as we can. If you do ask a question, we won't mention your name or company, so do feel free to ask anything. And a reminder, slides will be available on the ACT website, and we'll send an email once they're there, but it should be by the end of tomorrow, hopefully. Now, before we start, let me make some introductions. My name is Naresh Agarwal, and after 30 years of working in Treasury, and I provide policy and technical support here at the ACT. More importantly, I really welcome Richard Hunter, who's the Global Group Head of Corporate Ratings for Fitch Ratings. Now, Fitch's corporate rating practice covers industrials, utilities, and real estate companies, and their corporate group rates over $10 trillion in bond and bank debt, built on the opinions of 400 dedicated corporate analysts based in 28 cities around the world. Previously, Richard served at Fitch as a regional credit officer responsible for Europe and Asia after heading the agency's global power practice in New York. Most recently, Richard ran Fitch's international corporate and utility rating practice for Europe and Asia. So there's a lot of experience to draw on there. I'll now head over to Richard, who over the next 40 minutes We'll share his thoughts on the ratings reviews during a time of business or interruptions. And as I said, we'll take questions during the session and if time allows at the end as well. Richard, over to you. Thanks, Narish. Um, and thanks to all of you for calling at this difficult time. Um, I hope everyone is safe and healthy wherever you're sheltering. Um, many of you will have been working with our analysts already, but it's important that, that we uh, as an agency uh, and as an industry, use every opportunity to put the work that you're doing with our analysts in context. As Nara says, um, some of you don't yet have ratings, maybe many of you. Um, there's also going to be a replay of this uh, webinar, so you can also share it with colleagues later. Um, part of the reason the ACT and we wanted to do this call was to make sure that we uh, answered as many of these questions here that were in the invite, and any more that you have that we can fill uh, the hour with today. Um, but before we do that, I thought it would be useful to start with a question for the audience. Um, so we're going to pause here just for a second and say, how do you think the rating agencies are reacted? Now, obviously, there are uh, three big agencies. We've all reacted slightly differently. Um, but just generally, from your perspective as treasurers, as issuers, how do you feel the rating agencies have reacted? So we'll pause for a second there. Naresh, I'll, uh, I'll wait your guidance as to when we should move on with this. Can you see things filling up? Give it just another second. It should have worked. So I'll now push the button on the right here and see what answer we get. Well, that's interesting. That's uh, that's quite an encouraging response there. Um, it's not often I, I go to events where people are as uh, perhaps supportive and positive about the rating agencies. If anything, people are thinking we're maybe being 
uh, a bit too slow and maybe not severe enough. Well, that's an interesting framework for us to move on. I'm going to take you through what our approach has been, and then we'll get on to uh, the different things that we'll be uh, doing in future to address this. So we're all aware right now any attempt to predict the future is exceptionally difficult. Now, we obviously know that, uh, and as Mr. Galbraith wisely said, knowing that is, is the first part of the path to wisdom. But at the same time, our ratings will be meaningless for you and everyone else if they don't sit on assumptions and a fairly robust process. So what kind of process can we take when we face something as unprecedented as the coronavirus? Well, at the start of the process, it was obvious that no one had a clear picture of what the scale of the impact would be, um, other than that it was a game changer and pretty clearly the end of the, the cycle that we had been anticipating for a couple of years now. So the first decision we took was to start, even without knowing what the scale of the problem was going to be, ranking the entities both by the sector's exposure to COVID-19, um, but also relative weakness that a company might have at its current rating level. So every rating has a set level of headroom with rating triggers for going up and down. And at that point, you can see that obviously some companies are lower in their rating headroom than others. So we did a kind of a three by three matrix you can see there. All of the companies we rate, they were put into screeners on that basis. Those screeners were all made public. And I think they're going to be in the related materials that you hopefully have next to you, um, uh, next to this slide on the webinar. So we looked at relative exposure. We then had to try and work out, well, what is the trajectory actually going to be? And there was a lot of discussion at the start about, is it a V, is it a U, is it a W? The shape that we settled on was, um, uh, and apologies to any IP lawyers on the phone, a, a Nike swoosh, which was a, a very sharp fall initially, uh, and then varying levels of trajectory moving backwards. Now, stimulus programs look to head off most of the depression risk, but it doesn't look to have headed off a severe recession. And certainly we were fairly clear in our minds that it wasn't going to a V-shaped recovery. What this uh, swoosh does, it tries to split out those sectors where we see that it will be uh, a differentiated response. There'll be some B2B sectors that are able to recover faster. There'll be some other sectors where the recovery is going to be depressed by the level of, of um, consumer wealth deterioration, unemployment, and so on. And the, uh, the red one, which is the greater possibility of distress, um, and at best, a greatly delayed recovery. Um, one of the things that did come up, I'm just sorry, I'm just checking we've got, okay, well, we're just, there's something in the chat room about some technicals, but it seems we're all back online. Um, now, one of the questions that's come up is, what is the role of liquidity? People are going out and obviously borrowing additional money, and um, liquidity is a necessary but not sufficient prerequisite for uh, maintaining existing ratings or achieving, certainly, investment grade. Now, if you're a lower rated name, so say you're already speculative grade, liquidity can avoid default, but it doesn't necessarily avoid potentially large rating actions. Uh, default is a plausible downside case for the companies who rated single B. Access liquidity is already a big focus when we look at those companies. Uh, part of the assumption when we assign investment grade ratings, on the other hand, is that liquidity is a given. So for those companies that we do give investment grade to, extra liquidity is generally providing cushion. Um, and then we're not really worried about the cost of negative carry at the moment, for example, um, or spike in your gross versus your net debt. However, liquidity is not going to be a replacement for operating cash flow. And that is obviously the biggest single problem today. Debt raised to fund a gap in operating cash flow is in essence just capitalizing losses which will have to be paid down in due course. Now, this chart here is just illustrating a fairly extreme example of an issuer compensating an entire loss of operating cash flow in a year with additional um, liquidity. Um, this would certainly be a downgrade case in any event, but certainly whether liquidity is available becomes a default, no default question, not one that necessarily supports existing ratings. Um, so what about the post-crisis recovery? Um, and this is where we get on to our topic about uh, assumptions. And this is, again, some insight into how the agencies are working. So in very simplified terms, we can take two 2021 scenarios, so next year for investment grade names. One where free cash flow gets an issuer closer to their starting position by the end of next year, 
one where the weakness of the recovery, on the other hand, leaves them with a hangover of existing higher indebtedness from the outbreak. And that gap, that little gap you see there with the, the red arrow, is uh, that's one of the key things that we're trying to assess. Now, obviously, the quantums are going to vary significantly. The levels of lost cash flow are going to vary substantially across your sectors and across different regions. Um, few companies are going to try and replace all of their operating losses with external liquidity. Some of the funding might be through equity or grants or grant-like funding. But generally, a lot will end up being debt, and a lot of that debt is going to be hard to work off. One point we have been making to uh, investors is that Positively, in normal times, most rated corporates are generally free cash flow positive. Now, next year is not going to be an average year uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but the underlying nature of the corporate portfolio that we rate, certainly at investment grade, is largely free cash flow positive. Bit of an outlier, the, the number here for oil and gas is a bit of a distraction. Uh, we all know how much the oil and gas sector can vary its capex bills up and down depending on, on the price. So that, that figure there is much more subject to variability. The rest, after dividends, you can see, are already uh, free cash flow positive in a median year. So a lot of that free cash flow, as everybody knows, over the last cycle was redeployed to M&A, to share buybacks, to lots of other areas. But there is some grounds for optimism perhaps there, even before we get to the main point, which is how corporates are going to respond. And, and this question of response, yeah, yeah. Sorry, interrupt. I've got a, a question here around uh, the consideration of cash in the future for the allocation of a grade. Will that change, do you think, as a result of the, um, the virus and the crisis? I'm just going to have a look at the question there. The which cash in the future for the allocation of a grade. So, basically, um, all our ratings are based on forecasts. So right now, if you sit in a committee, uh, and there are, as you can imagine, lots going on today, they are looking at what your numbers are at the end of 2021 and the end of 2022. Now, obviously, it's difficult to make forecasts, so we are using these assumptions to get there. We're also talking to companies about what measures the company can undertake, because obviously the revenue number is going to come down very substantially. What cost efficiencies are they going to make? What capex deferrals are they going to make? What other measures, what other fundraising are they going to make? So we are absolutely looking at uh, cash flow generated by the company in the future as something on which we base uh, the rating assessment. So that's going to be operating cash flow. It's going to be uh, whatever they're doing to their capex and sacrosanct that they might be, the dividend bills as well, uh, and also external funding that they might come in. But certainly it is very much, and I think that's fair for all the three agencies, a forward-looking process. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was actually, that was a, it was a, I was just actually getting to that point, about that point about the responses. I'm just going to go through some slides that are rather depressing um, of what we are using as our baseline assumptions as a starting point for this year and next year. But it is absolutely critical. Right now, if you go out there and, you, uh, again, you talk to investors or bankers or you know, anybody really, you don't have to be a genius to work out the companies that are exposed to leisure or retail or transport um, are in a weaker position than telcos or utilities right now. What we are going to add value to uh, as, as an industry and, and certainly Fitch as an agency is by saying, well, let's think about what each individual company rationally can do to respond to this. That will involve usually talking to the companies at, at some length. Um, obviously, it's a fairly compressed timeline right now. But to understand what is that response, that's a critical part because it's not just where the revenue cuts come. It's what can companies reasonably do to offset that. So if we move on to just that point, um, actually, before we get to that, we're going to do another audience poll, I think. So we're going to find out where you are on this. So as an audience, when, when do you expect your revenue as a company to recover to 2019 levels? And we've got uh, five options there for the, the very bold amongst you, 2020. Um, going right the way through to after 2023. So we'll give everyone a, a few seconds to do that. All right, we usually give these things about 30 seconds, don't we? So we'll just click through and see what the 
answer is there. That's interesting. That's interesting. That that looks kind of that looks kind of consistent um, with uh, I guess what we're about to go through. What we did was, and there were a lot of reasons why we did this. Um, as I just Nurse and I were just discussing, our, the rating process is a forward-looking one. There's no point trying to work out whether you're going to default by looking at the numbers you had one year ago, two years ago, three years ago. You're going to pay back your debts in the future. You're not going to pay them back yesterday. So we have to have this be a forward-looking process. At the same time, projecting right now is enormously difficult. So we had to come up with assumptions that we could do for headline sectors to give our analysts internally a sense of the orders of magnitude that they would see in the world. So we didn't project every single sector to start with. We took some big headline sectors and said, where do you think your sector will be as an analyst relative to the sectors we're just about to talk about? So if we look at those, if we start with one that's obviously uh, pretty heavily affected, the airline sector, um, our expectation for revenue passenger kilometers this year is down 45 to 50 percent in 2020. It does recover next year, but it's still down 20% versus 2019. Now, I did ask the analysts when we did these numbers, can you give me an example of what it was like the last bad downturn? And the US downturn after 9-11, uh, and same thing in around about 2009 as well, minus 5 to 6%. And we are saying it's going to be down 20% at the end of 2021. If we look at uh, car sales, Again, worst period we've seen uh, in the recent history was down 3% in 2009. That's because a lot of Western um, demand destruction was picked up by the Chinese who are growing at 40% a year. We're saying 15% down this year, and the bounce back next year is only going to take it down to 8% down, obviously a similar effect on steel production. If we look at uh, well, the oil sector, obviously everybody saw the headlines about oil yesterday. Um, we may have to have another look at our oil demand forecast here. But again, for comparison, in 2009, Brent was trading at $75 a barrel equivalent. So very substantially down, again, even against 2019 numbers. If we look at retail sales, another area of extreme pain, down 30% this year in our projections. The recovery is still going to leave it down at least 10% in most places next year for uh, discretionary retail. Um, and again, if you go back to 2009, it was down about 9% in one year and then bounced back. If we then look at advertising, similar story. We actually think, excluding the Olympics, it might be two years of recession for advertising in the U.S. Similar story through new houses and also through, uh, unsurprisingly, hotel uh, RevPAR. So for all these different sectors, that is the order of magnitude we're talking about, seeing 2021 still substantially down on 2019. That is, of course, if you look there, a selection of amongst our most heavily affected sectors. Um, so that's how we've approached this. We box things into relative vulnerability. We looked at a trajectory. We came up for assumptions for that trajectory. Um, what actually has happened so far with the ratings? Um, this Richard, is a little bit we... of an eye. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, before we go on to the impact on the ratings, one of the questions we've had is around the assumptions underpinning what you've just talked about, given how yeah. so unique and there's no precedent around a sort of global event as we're sort of currently experiencing. I mean, do you have a sense of how, how difficult it's been, how robust it's been possible to actually build some of these um, assumptions for, you know, the next year or two? Yeah, I think that's a very fair question. Um, I think the reality is, this is why we're using the term assumptions. Typically, we talk about forecasts because it's a relatively small order of magnitude of change from one year to the next, um, absent big M&A. And even M&A is reasonably easy for us to build into our models. This is completely unprecedented. We did have to ask the analysts to step outside their comfort zones. Um, and in fairness, they weren't doing it on their own. They have been talking to management teams in the sectors that they've been rating to get a sense of the order of magnitude they sensed as well. We also have a global economics team who have been reforecasting the economy uh, on a, basically every two weeks now since the crisis started, and they've given us an order of magnitude of uh, GDP declines. I think it's fair to say that the numbers we have been coming up with in the corporate team have been a little bit more negative, and gradually as things have moved on, I think that some of our GDP estimates are are catching up with the uh, the numbers that we've been putting for the corporates. 
But I would make no warrant to the science, and I would also say that these are much more likely to be revised as forecast levels over the next, forget year, over the next three months, six months than would normally be the case. The important thing for us is it's, it's the, the frustration for us is we like, as you will do as treasurers and as your uh, strategic teams internally will like to do, we like to have the sense of a robust, comfortable forecast that we can say that's solid, it's conservative, we know where all the moving parts are. We are not in that world just now, but unfortunately, the best thing we can do is come out with a set of an assumptions and say, that's the bogey. What could the response be to that bogey? What's the order of magnitude uh, of response the company can bring to that bogey? And then act based on, on that. So there will be more frequent revisions to the forecast, but it was kind of an iterative process in some cases. Um, and in many cases, it's also involved talking to um, our economists and to a, a range of other parties as well. And then just sort of... Um, a, a, a sort of an, another sort of detailed question about looking forward and some of your key assumptions is around dividend policies. So we've seen already a number of companies making changes to their sort of historical dividend policies. Does that affect your um, go forward rating? Um, it does. Dividends can be quite substantial. We have seen companies in the past make very substantial changes to the dividend policy. That is a fairly large lever that, that uh, many companies can pull. And that, that's my point here about saying the the skill in this job is not saying we think, you know, a sector exposed to leisure or, or retail is bad, so we're just going to downgrade everybody or put everyone on rating watch. It's understanding, um, in most cases, by talking to the company, what are the plans that they have, bearing in mind, obviously, the company themselves. I mean, everybody on this call is facing the same pressure to act very rapidly. Um, but we will give credit for the capacity to cut dividends, and obviously financial policy is a key part of our, our rating criteria. What the company's uh, commitment is relative to keeping a certain leverage profile in in um, in balance with what they're going to hand out to to shareholders and other stakeholders. Okay, and then and then one I I, I thought was quite interesting. I think it's sort of quite cheeky, but um, we live in unusual times. Uh, huh. This question about the, future, the danger with future assessments is they could become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, is it possible you're you're leading us into a, a bigger downturn as a as an industry than if yeah. it had been left to its own devices? Yeah, I think that's you know it's not the, the least bit cheeky. So whoever asked that, thank you, because it it's part of a wider subset of. Um, the yeah, you know, it's a fairly frequent accusation that the rating agencies are sort of pyromaniac firemen. They they, they turn up when the fire's there and they just make it worse. Um, the there's a few things with that. One is um, I think a lot of us right now would like to hit a pause button. You know, the governments, for all the best reasons, have hit pause buttons on the economy because it was the uh, only acceptable choice to make for human life. But they pressed a pause button. And lots of us would like to press pause buttons on many things as a result of that. And you could say, well, why not press a pause button on the ratings? Um, because there's no option where we can go ahead, obviously, with our existing assumptions uh, and continue carrying on with ratings as if nothing had happened. So I, I, I'm sure no one on the call would even begin to think of that as an option. So what about pressing a, a pause button? Well, as soon as we press a pause button, the ratings then depart from what has clearly become a much worse situation, a much worse situation for some companies more even than for others. So when we then get to the stage of saying, so we, we, we can't press that, that, that pause button, because if we do, we'll see that the ratings then lose all credibility. And if we say, well, could we just stop using ratings for a bit? Because you know, frankly, it's telling us stuff that we largely already know about the economy, there are negative externalities. There are triggers based on ratings. There are financing access conditions based on ratings. There are um, investment considerations based on ratings. Um, does it really help to have the market look to ratings at a time like this? And actually, the reality is if, if you did take ratings out of the picture, one thing you can't put a pause on is the market. And the market needs a measure. And if the market doesn't have ratings as a measure, pretty much every other measure the market is going to look to, uh, by definition, 
is not just more volatile than ratings, it's going to be orders of magnitude more volatile. And we have seen that in cases in the past when, when frankly, if the agencies were stood accused of, of anything, it was probably more effectively that the agencies were too slow to respond. So I think that uh, it is a very important question. Is, is there an idea here where we're actually making the situation worse with these downgrades? And the reality is, um, certainly from our perspective, we are not. it's a necessary task. Uh, no one takes any great pleasure in the amount of downgrade activity that we've had over the last six weeks. But it is the only way to get um, a, a more measured response than the market itself would deliver when companies are looking for, for financing access. Okay, I've got that more, but we'll, we'll go through the rest of your slides and then we'll pick up some more of these questions. Yeah, yeah, I've only got a couple. Yeah, just a couple more to go. So really, it was just to say exactly on that point about uh, nobody takes any great pleasure in the number of negative actions that we've, we've had to take uh, so far. A very significant number of negative actions, um, you know, slightly over 300. Quite concentrated so far. So 75% of those are inside uh, consumer natural resources, which is main oil and gas. Uh, leisure and transport. Two thirds of them are in speculative grade, so investment grade has generally got away more with watches and outlooks are happening as frequently as downgrades. Speculative grade is much more towards downgrades, much more often, often severe downgrades. So far, only 17 what we call fallen angels, which is companies losing investment grade. Um, that's relatively minor compared to uh, fears at the start. Uh, there will be more, I'm sure but it's, it's not been quite as widespread as some people feared right at the start. Um, others, which is probably not relevant for this call, falling to triple C, which is what we, we call the, the distressed range. Um, I think one point to mention here, and uh, you kind of alluded to this at the start, Ramesh, there are a, a lot of companies in Europe that would be investment grade that just aren't in the bond market. And one of the things, whenever you see reference made to uh, all the different rating actions from all the agencies, is an awful lot of the industries most affected are not in the bond markets or were not in the bond markets a month ago. Uh, a lot of the retail, a lot of the leisure companies in Europe uh, just aren't in the bond market. They're not traditionally bond market visiting companies. Um, this, uh, this crisis may actually change that depending how people end up using the, the different support mechanisms, but that is where the, uh, the action has been concentrated. Um, so yeah, so then we could uh, move to the, the Q&A, I think. Okay. Um, so here's an interesting one. Credit, credit spreads we've kept in the last few weeks, mainly on government responses. Do you think the market reactions have been a bit too relaxed, and do you see any areas of systemic risk at the moment? Um, yeah, I think the shorthand way we have of uh, describing the government responses, which have obviously been very, very, very substantial, is that they are doing what it takes, what is plausible that they can do, to stave off a depression. Um, we don't believe it's staving off a recession. We expect a very uh, a tripling of default rates. We expect more rating actions uh, like the slide you've just seen going forward. So we... Uh, is the market being too sanguine? The bond market generally is a much better indicator than the equity market. Every time the bond market and the equity market disagree, the bond market's always right. It's like your annoying friend. Um, but even here, I think there's probably been, uh, again, questions around how liquid the market is, whether the pricing signals are particularly effective at this point. Um, certainly, the degree to which spreads came back in is probably not going to be sustained, if you ask me. Again, we don't give advice on um, on pricing matters uh, or market pricing. Just in, as an individual, I, I think it's difficult to see that being sustained. I think we have a lot more pain to come, as, as, as our assumptions have kind of indicated. Um, some of your um, views around sort of trends around automotive um, and sort of hospitality sectors uh, had a... Um, a did they have a strong USA focus? Is, was this reflective on a geographic basis or a sort of global view? Yeah, the, those ones, uh, the the leisure names, which includes our hospitality, uh, the, the big bias, again, uh, a lot of the chains in Europe are, are, are not in the bond market at the moment. There's a lot more family-run, smaller operations that don't visit the bond market. So there's a bias there towards the US and coverage. We would expect the ultimate public rating actions, however, where those companies to be in the bond markets to be roughly the same. 
Autos, we have similar coverage globally. So there's, you know, uh, three big companies in the States, uh, you know, four big companies in Europe, uh, three big companies in Asia. So we, uh, that's been pretty much globally shared. So we've seen relatively small moves on the OEM so far. Renault lost investment grade, but otherwise, generally it's been outlook changes so far for the more resilient of the automakers. Um, I think there's a slight difference of opinion between the agencies there. We seem to be taking a slightly more, um, uh, I wouldn't say uh, positive, but a less negative view on the auto sector, uh, certainly up till this point. Okay, and then I've had a few questions, one around bank ratings. Um, so what do you think about them going forward? I guess the, you know, the, require, the request from the ECB and the PRA to restrict banking dividends is going to be positive for their ratings, but do you see any downgrades coming soon or later? Yeah, we've actually uh, already taken a lot of actions uh, around the globe on the banking sectors. I think actually the European banking sector saw uh, the most activity for us. Again, I should stress before we go down this path, this is out my bailiwick. Uh, we have a, a, a separate uh, group that deals with banks and, and very effectively do, they do it too. Um, generally, outlook and watch, and watch changes with a few um, isolated negative actions on, on again, similar situation uh, institutions that were either weaker or in higher exposure areas. I think we've got around most of the European banking sectors, certainly uh, the European banking sectors already. Um, sovereign sovereign risks, you know, the UK government's going to have a much bigger debt pile at the end of this. Um, what's your sense around sovereign risk? We have, uh, we've actually published, and again, a uh, separate group within Fitch, uh, a very talented group of sovereign analysts, they've actually published something. If someone's interested in this, if you go to our website, all our coronavirus research is currently free, that they have published something on the uh, frequency of downgrades, this is already the worst year they've had for downgrades on records, the frequency uh, for multi-notch downgrades that they can predict, and they are also, uh, our sovereign team have a, uh, a public interactive model that you can use to see what the, and effectively here, the big thing is the fiscal deterioration, what impact that might have on sovereign ratings. And I think they've been quite clear at saying that they do expect further negative action to come. I, I would just pause there for a second Something I didn't put in the presentation, but we should absolutely make sure you, your members are aware of. When it comes to models, we have an online tool called Navigator that allows you to take a look at what you think your rating would be um, under different scenarios. But you can also use it to put in a completely uh, new company. So it's, it's set up to uh, display the existing companies we have. Um, but it's also you can just put in a, a brand new company on your own using one of our 50 sector templates. Uh, and the nice thing about that is it's absolutely scot free. Um, but so perhaps after the call, Naresh, I'll send you the link for that and you can pass it on to people on the call because that can be useful for people trying to get a sense of whether they as corporates are investment grade as well. That, that, that'd be really helpful. And in fact, I'll, I'll do a quick plug for our um, weekly newsletter that comes out every Wednesday that gives treasurers ideas of some of the resources that folks like yourselves are providing to treasury people everywhere to help them get a sense of this current crisis and how to navigate their way through it. Um, I've got one question around the Bank of England CCFF program. Um, are you aware mm -hmm. of any companies not being able to access it because they've had a recent investment grade downgrade? Um, uh, I can say in all honesty, uh, I'm, I'm not. Um, the, the, there were a couple of things there, so I've just moved it on to the slide. Can everybody see that uh, slide about the CCFF facility there? A um, couple of things with this. We uh, One of the things that it talked about was if you could get an opinion from somebody to say what your rating was at the 1st of March. I think it was the 1st of March. and um, Or you otherwise have an investment grade rating today. One thing we can't do, uh, I don't know if the other guys can do it or not, is we can't do, if you like, counterfactual or retrospective ratings as to what you might have been had the world been different. Um, that's just something that we are, um, we're not particularly able to provide that. We wouldn't be minded to provide that if we could. We don't think that's a, a healthy thing for people to be, to be focused on um, at the current time. So we are not aware um, 
and again, we've only had a couple of people come to us and ask for that, to be honest, out of the uh, fairly substantial number of people who've approached us thus far on CCFF. There's only a couple who've said, well, could you do it as of March 1st? What we can uh, give people is there's, there's three things here. There's a credit opinion uh, or a rating. Now, a credit opinion is something short of a rating. We can do that in one to two weeks. Uh, a rating we can do in, in two to four weeks. A uh, rating, if you've been thinking of just getting a rating for a while, it might be the time to, to just bite the bullet and get on with it. Um, we also have a thing I've mentioned there, credit indication. What that is, is uh, you'll appreciate our analysts can take a look at a company and tell relatively swiftly if they don't think it's going to get to investment grade. We do see quite a few companies where we say, maybe there's a possibility, but we don't think it's in anyone's interest to waste either your or our time by looking at a company that we would say clearly is a single B category company and then you know pursuing alternative avenues so the credit indication within a couple of days we can get back to you and say we looked at it and unfortunately uh, well not unfortunately but just in this circumstance if you require an investment grade rating it wouldn't come out that way obviously there are many good reasons to get single b and double b ratings as well um, the credit opinion will take one to two weeks that is accepted we understand by the bank of england and obviously a rating is accepted uh, by the bank of england they can be either public or or private um, so yeah, so I don't I don't think we've heard of anyone being certainly we have had people who have approached us who have asked about this who we have said uh, at the current time you would not be investment grade we've seen a, a reasonable number of those yeah. And I guess this is much faster than you would normally sort of operate your rating process. Um, it's not, and and you know it's it's a bit of an, an old question which is how how long can you take to do a rating. Uh, the, the, the shortest way of answering it is it's much faster to write a question than answer a question. Um, right. So we can uh, produce ratings very quickly. We can produce a rating inside a week. It is doable, particularly if we have prior knowledge of the company. And you'll understand a lot of the companies that we rate, we look at other companies as their peers, uh, or they might already have an internal opinion from us. Um, the real issue with the timing is the the best way to get a rating for all concerned is if there's a, a reasonable amount of dialogue between us and the company. The amount of detail we go into when we're talking to a company to get a rating, we, there's a lot of detail about your debt, about your financing structures, a lot of de detail about your cash. The rest of the questions are really about getting our analysts to be able to form a forecast on, on what you're going to do. You know, in these circumstances, obviously, lots of interesting questions to ask. But it's not like the due diligence you would do for a bond issue uh, you might be used to with lawyers or even necessarily with underwriting banks. It, it's a much broader thing than that. It's essentially trying to get you into one of 15 buckets to cover the global economy, 15 notches. So, yeah, it's, it's not as invasive as people sometimes uh, think. So it can be done more, uh, more rapidly than the traditional four to six weeks that we used to say. And just to sort of focusing around people who haven't had a rating before, could you, I guess, do at least a couple of things? One is tell, you know, tell folks who are listening to this what things they could do to make the process easier for you and for them. And yep. also what are, what are the sort of biggest misconceptions you think that folks going into this process have, which you then have to spend a bit of time managing? Um, things to make it easier. Um, in reality, anybody who has any kind of shareholder base or has any kind of external investors at all, it's the kind of information you give to them. We probably are more forensic with your forecasts than perhaps you know maybe the equity side would be if you're talking to them. A little bit more forensic understanding your assumptions. We actually build our own forecasts. We obviously don't take issue of forecasts. We build our own forecasts, but we use information from the companies uh, to inform our operating model. So the more detail you can provide around your uh, cost assumptions, your capex assumptions, your financial policy. The financial policy is a big one. It's still surprising. Sometimes we come across companies who don't have a particularly well-articulated um, leverage policy or you know, uh, indebtedness level policy. That, that doesn't play well with the rating agencies. Uh, you, you won't be surprised to hear. So that is absolutely something you want to make sure you have a polished response on and some contingency plans on if this happened, we could do that. If that happened, we could do this. Um, that is something that we spend a, a lot of time looking at. Um, we have been asked in the past, does it help to get a bank to advise you? Um, you don't have to get a bank to advise you. They are reasonably well clued up on what the different criteria from the agencies are. 
They are generally for an initial rating in Europe, they can actually be quite helpful. And uh, I shouldn't say this, but they shouldn't certainly be charging you for that process. They should be looking for the money out of you from somewhere else. So yes, I would say to make it easier, good, well-articulated, clear financing, um, uh, financial policy, detail around your debt structure, detail around your cash, as much color as you can give on your operating forecast as you can. That, that's, kind of, uh, that's kind of the critical points to hit. In terms of misconceptions, um, I think it gets back to the point about just the level of detail. We have 20 points on our rating scale. We're not handing out many new double A's or, tri or triple A's. Uh, once you get to single C or D, you're defaulting. So there's basically 50 notches that we have to fit everyone between, you know, basically you and Microsoft into uh, into a grid. So there's a, a don't worry too much about the, the the idea that our questions are going to be oriented towards a false precision. It's really about getting a sense of a shape of how your company will respond, uh, obviously in this crisis, but just respond to different challenges. Uh, what the, the priorities you have are, what your market position is, what your diversification levels are. And again, uh, back on that navigator plug, when you get the, uh, if you have a look at that free tool, every sector has a little template. It talks about the key things that we look at, whether it's you know, your place on the cost curve as a mining company or your brand portfolio as a consumer company. So those things are all pretty public out there. And you can get a good idea of that before you even talk to the agency. Okay, there have been a few questions. You, you, you mentioned a bit about um, the news yesterday on oil prices, and some of the people listening in are either working for oil and gas or based out in the GCC. Given what we've seen in the last few days, um, what do you think the impact is going to be on ratings of oil producing countries and sovereign wealth funds? Yeah, again, so ratings on countries is a, uh, that is a, a, a different team. Uh, that team would highlight to you the importance of the oil price. They typically do a calculation where they show you what the clearing price is for the, the state budget and what that means for the company, the country's deficit and therefore in turn for their, uh, for their debt levels. Um, I would say for corporates, um, actually we use the same price deck across the corporate and sovereign team. Uh, and that's maybe an important point to make because not everybody does. We have a deck. So, for example, our deck is still at 35. It might come down in the future, but it's clearly it was 14 or something at the uh, the end of last week. So it was already well below our deck. Our deck takes a blended price for the year, and then we move back towards what we think the uh, the, the long term price will be because we couldn't possibly run forecasts uh, on a daily basis on something as volatile as the oil price. So there is more stability to our projections than there is to the price deck. That said, when the price deck does move, it does tend to, uh, if it's a significant shift, we saw that last month or earlier this month, it does mean that the weaker oil companies tend to move. Stronger oil companies, the majors don't tend to move too much. But if you're a single B rated oil company, single B means you have a limited margin for safety. Uh, you are pretty much delivered to the next 18 months, 24 months of, of actual oil price receipts. Um, here's an interesting question. Um, you had a lot of negative and red numbers on your forecast. <laughs> are there yeah. any sectors whose rating um, you think is going to improve? Um, it's very rare in a recession. I'm, I, I'm listening to that question, and believe it or not, we did this in the Eurozone crisis. I actually asked our team to write a, a report on where are the positive stories? Who could be, get, be upgraded? It was the single least downloaded report of the year. I was depressed to see. <laughs> um, but uh, which might say something about human nature. Um, in this particular circumstance, it is very rare to see material uh, upgrades in a recession. I would stress I can't find a period in our history where we had no upgrades, so there will still be upgrades. I don't think it'll be on a sector basis, though. I think it'll be companies where there might be consolidation going on. That would lift market share and various other metrics that might improve them. Companies who are succeeding in delevering because they're in slightly more sheltered sectors. There's no sector we would point at today. I think Tesco is a, a nice example. I don't want to call out an individual name, but I think Tesco have done an exceptional job, uh, obviously, over the course of the crisis. And many of us walking past Tesco shops probably thought that the, the, the supermarkets were doing exceptionally well. Uh, but they laid out, even for a store that was certainly enormously busy at the, at the start of the crisis, 
additional costs that are coming, additional consumer elements that are coming, additional challenges that are coming. So I don't think we'd see anyone who secularly as a sector has a positive spin for this. Um, equally, as I say, I can't find a period on record. Even last week, we still had some upgrades. U.S. utilities, but we still had some upgrades. Okay. Um, here's a really important one for many of our members. It's um, about uh, – so the question says, do you have a, a quantum level, revenue or EBITDA, below which you would not consider a company investment grade? That's a cracking question. Um, we, we have a rule of thumb – uh, I, it's always, you know, it's in my interest to say there's no good answer to that question. It's case by case. There's a rule of thumb. It's about 100 million sterling uh, would be things below 100 million sterling. Uh, and again, bear in mind, we're putting the entire global corporate economy onto essentially 15 steps. Um, the triple B and single A are the top six steps out of those 15. So most of the most of the economy as you walk down the high street is, is not investment grade. So um, 100 million is a good ballpark figure. If you're below that, we have to look at, is it, a, is it a REIT? Is it maybe a small utility or something like that? Generally, it's difficult for companies below 100 million to, um, to make it. Not impossible, but difficult if, you, if you're looking for a rule of thumb. Okay, that's very, very helpful. We've, um, we're sort of coming to the end of the, of the sort of 45 minutes we had. Um, Richard, have you got any sort of closing remarks or thoughts, sort of bring it all together um, before we sort of conclude? Um, I, I, I will say the slides, if you can download the slides, there's a whole bunch of uh, um, ancillary material, a lot of other webinars that we have actually done on individual sectors and individual topics, which are again free to access. So, so do take a look at those if, if you have time. Other than that, I would simply say that Really, the I, I think what 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 it's difficult to say you 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 take pleasure in any of of what's happening. What I've taken pride in when I've looked at the way my analysts have worked at this is responding to this challenge and keeping up the level of dialogue with issues. Because as I say, there's no prizes for saying that leisure or retail or travel or, or uh, you know heavy manufacturing might be more exposed to this than other sectors. The challenge is going to be on a name by name basis. What can those companies do and where does that place them on those 15 steps I was talking about? So really, to those of you either, whether you have ratings or not, dialogue with the analyst. The analyst will always pick up the phone to you. Uh, they value that dialogue um, just as much as you do. So do make sure that you, you stay in touch with the analysts or if you haven't reached out, feel free. There's a whole list of sector contacts on the, the back of the webinar to, to reach out to them as well. Okay, well, um, thank you again, Richard, for taking your time. I think you, you're, what did you say, you're the only person in your, on your floor today, in your office? I'm the only person here because a provider whose name I won't give, the broadband is not particularly great in my house right now. So I'm literally the only person in a 13-story building. Okay, well, thanks again for uh, making the, the journey to Canary Wharf. Um, hopefully everyone has found this webinar useful. We had loads of questions. Um, and I'm sorry we didn't get through to answer all of them, but hopefully it's given you a better sense of, of sort of what a rating agency feels about the current market. Hopefully helpful. Um, we've got details for Richard and myself. If you have questions that we didn't answer that you think of later, please feel free. And, you know, we're all committed to try and help provide information to the market to help you folks running businesses to, you know, be successful. Um, as you know, it's a reminder, we have the International Treasury Week, uh, 11th to 14th of May. It's uh, free to attend and it's open to non-members. And we're delighted to confirm that Mark Carney, Governor of the Bank of England from 2013 to 2020, will be providing the keynote speech. Um, we've got a number of other events. We are hoping that they will still run uh, starting in September in the Middle East. Um, so first of all, I'd say thank you very much for the questions. Um, we'll be doing a write-up after this, and we'll, we'll try and address some of the questions we didn't answer today through a write-up. And a request, if you can take time to fill in the survey. <clears throat> That's feedback is really helpful. <coughs> um, as you know, this event's being recorded, and you should receive an email. Also, <clears throat> my throat is dry. Um, in the next few days, confirming it's available. So all that leaves is to me to say thank you very much, Richard, for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks very much.